It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, where every week we seek inspiration from great men and women to become the heroes and heroines of our own life. And you are here with your hosts. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great, Andy. Happy to celebrate one of the first female authors in Western civilization who opened the door to so many others uh, from the Enlightenment era. Who are we talking about today? Right, a great, a great novelist, and that is, that is the great Jane Austen. And yes. we are honored to have as a guest today, Dr. Deanna Hakenin, who is an educator amongst so many other talents. And, and how'd you describe yourself, Dr. D, as a big Jane Austen fan? Is that, was that what you said? Yeah, I'm a big fan. I have been for years and um, I've also taught her. So I'm probably, you know, I've done a lot of research on her as well. So I'm not just, you know, I've read her novels and I like it. I've kind of dug down, dug down a little bit, but I don't consider right. myself an expert because there are some amazing experts out there. Right. All right. Okay. But, but we're all Jane Austen fans with yes. Jane Austen readers. And so, you know, my, my first question is what's, why is Jane Austen continue so popular, you know, in the 21st century? Yeah. Uh, there's all these movies and TV shows about on, on her novels, a lot on Pride and Prejudice, perhaps her most mm -hmm. popular novel. What makes what makes her uh, her popularity to continue to endure in, in this way, Dr. D? Well, there's one thing. I mean, you can always say her novel is timeless, but what does that really mean? Um, her characters are relatable. Even though these were novels were written um, 200 years ago, we've celebrated 200 year anniversaries um, of them, most some of them, not all of them. And um, so it's amazing to see that you could read these novels that were written in a completely different time period where customs and manners, decorum, um, and even the rights of women, which I know we'll talk about more, we're so different than our own, but there's a universal language there that is appealing. That idea of will they or won't they um, in terms of Pride and Prejudice, or that idea of definite people that are good and bad. Like she lets you know, this is a good character and this is a bad character. And she does it through their behavior. It's not through, you know, this sort of, um, tons of dialogue where they point themselves mm -hmm. out. She does it in a way that is just really captivating. And one of my favorite things about her is she is really funny. She's extraordinarily she, witty. She, she, she is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let me say, let me just add something. My favorite thing is yeah. that moral rectitude matters in Jane Austen's universe. Mm -hmm. My character matters. Yes. We, we see that in Pride and Prejudice where, mm -hmm. where what's his name, Bingham? is charming and you know mm -hmm. Elizabeth Bennett likes him at first but then she realizes he's a scoundrel and Wickham. Darcy Sorry. yeah th yeah th that's right <laughs> that's right that's right Wickham thank you Bingham yeah that's right Wickham Wickham is charming but and Elizabeth initially attracted to Elizabeth Bennett initially attracted him but she realizes he's a scoundrel and she wants nothing mm -hmm. to do with him whereas Darcy is not charming but Darcy has has moral backbone and this yeah. and this way she comes to you know fall in love with him yeah yeah I, I love that I love that you know there's no there's, there's there's not a lot of grays in Jane Austen's universe there's black and white and no. moral you know moral character matters above all and I think that's what you know that's why a lot of people today can you know can still relate to Jane Austen she's she's writing about you know mor morality issues and also romantic love I mean who's not who's not yes. interested in, in romantic love Andy, right. let, me mean, let me let me jump let me in just, here. Just, because... Let me just say let me just say one thing, Robert, because it is it is a truth universally acknowledged that a young man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> to, coin, to coin to coin a phrase. Best opening <laughs> coin... line in literature. Yeah, that's the opening line in Pride that, and Prejudice. I, that I that is a, that's a classic. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, to me, the the major appeal. Of, Piggybacking on that, that, certainly the morality, the, the the strength of character, particularly in the females, um, but also just what Andy said, they live happily ever after. At the right. end, right. all the conflict that happens, it, they, she resolves it so quickly and you, you just, you close the book with a big smile on your face. Yeah. Yes, they should have been together. And yes, even though it took 400, 300 pages for them to be bickering, 
they end up together. I feel happy. This was a rewarding experience uh, for for me in my own life. I can go out to you know to, to this fantasy world, this world of literature and novels. What you know, something that they provide, and be and be satisfied uh, at the end. Yeah, and and Absolutely. and Jane Austen's, Jane I was Austen's say, characters. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. Um, uh, she, I, I imagine every time I reread and I finish a novel again. It's tied up in this beautiful pink satin bow, just like a Mozart symphony. Just, you know, like yes. there's something about that era where yes. they wanted things like just neatly tied up. Not everyone, but the ones that really appeal to me. So, um, and it's, too. it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, yeah it's a great experience being immersed in Jane Austen's universe. So it, Pride and Prejudice, I assume, is her most popular novel. There's endless movies yes you know, 20 shows. million copies pride and right. prejudice well you oh, know yeah, it is her most popular and it's like, i think the best intro into jane austen if you're yeah. never read her it's the best one to start with i have a you know, list of what and her first her first published right anonymously published that was her first 1813 i think yeah right. no actually sense and sensibility sense and sensibility was oh, 1811. 1811 that was you're first. right sorry i have yeah. I, that's right, right. Mm -hmm. well that's <laughs> why we have dr d on the show it's true yeah she yeah. may not claim to be an expert but i think she is but anyhow not to put any pressure on you dan but uh <laughs> uh memorable characters um jane bennett elizabeth's older sister is such a good i mean she's a beautiful woman she's such a good natured soul she's such a good person anybody who doesn't like, you know, read Pride and Prejudice and doesn't like Jane Ben and have to have the soul of Osama bin Laden. I mean, she is she is just a sweetheart of a girl. But still, you know, I, Elizabeth is my favorite character, as, as I'm sure she was Jane Austen's, um, because she's so smart and she's so forthright. She's so frank and witty. That scene, that scene with with Lady Catherine, where you're, oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> you know, who is a spoiler alert in case yeah. you haven't oh, read her words. Yeah, yeah, so spoiler recommend. alert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the Lady Catherine, great characterization, by the way, by Jane Austen. Lady Catherine is an officious harridan, <laughs> you know, real formidable witch. And she, you know, she's demanding that Jane, uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Bennett re refuse any offer of marriage to Mr. Tossy. And Elizabeth very politely and respectfully basically tells her to go pound sand. Uh, you know, it's just, she has so much moral backbone. She doesn't even have to get angry. She just very calmly tells Lady Catherine, you know, no, you know, and it's just the, the moral strength of, of uh, Jane Austen's characters and, you know, and the heroines, because like you said, uh, Dan, there's not a lot of heroines portrayed like that in, in fiction who are quietly, confidently, you know, morally upright and have the moral backbone yeah. to stand up to a witch like, uh, you know, like Lady Catherine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just in Pride and Prejudice that you see that. You see that in all of her novels. Yes, you do. Um, you know, in Persuasion, Anne Elliot, I mean, her the father is a complete fop. And Anne Elliot is the moral compass, but she is so so much of a dutiful daughter, which is very, you know, what that time period would have required, um, mm -hmm. that she listens to people and she doesn't follow her own heart until the end where she finally has this amazing character arc and um takes herself seriously and what makes her happy and that her family can't do it for her she's got to make these choices um and just so you know jane austen fans are called jaynites and you a lot of jaynites favorite novel is persuasion it was her last and you can see the maturity in it so i always recommend reading that one last mm -hmm. okay in case you're so keeping I'd, I'd like tabs, to... writing down the order that i recommend them <clears throat> Yeah, we'll spend more time going through the order. Yeah. I just want to say, on staying on this theme, my favorite is Mansfield Park. Uh, Fanny uh, Price is my favorite heroine for two reasons. It's it almost has like a Cinderella feel, where she's her natural family of these dirt poor people, and then a distant she's sent over to a distant relative where she meets the 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 young uh, the daughters young daughters, and they kind of spurn her of of the household. But the one boy, um, Edmund, uh, gives her paper to write. And one thing about oh, everything in Jane Austen books, her universe, reading and writing is essential. And I just love that. And also, you know, tea. I drink tea a lot. And Mozart's music is in the background. So those are additions. But in Mansfield Park, she challenges the father, head of the household, who says, you will marry 
this man. I can't remember the character. And she's like, no, Henry Crawford. No, I won't. And okay, he kicks her out. She's got to go back home to a dirt poor family. And one of the criticisms she has of him is um, he the slave trade in Antigua. And he she challenges on that. So that that was epic. Back, this is 18, you know, 13 period where authors are, are challenging the, the, the slave trade. Uh, to me, that's why that's my my favorite character and my, and my favorite novel of hers. Jane Austen has a very strong moral compass. It comes through in all of yes. her. I haven't, I haven't read all mm-hmm. of them, but the ones I've read, it mm-hmm. comes through, it comes through in all of them. That's what I love uh, about Jane Austen's books. Uh, Deanna, let me let me ask you this. So uh, she had to publish anonymously right? because it was, you know, you know, the, the reading public, oh no, horrors. This book was written by a by a by a woman. But uh, but the, correct me if I'm wrong here, the good news, part of the good news here is her, her father recognized his daughter's talents and he was able to to get her her novels published is that is that how is that how it happened um it was and she also had a brother who helped work with a publisher so you would have to have a man kind of do the in between the business side of things although she was very business savvy and people i mean it wasn't that it was completely anonymous i mean she went at the bequest of the prince regent to go see him because he bought the absolute first copy of any Jane Austen novel, which was Sense and Sensibility. He bought the first copy. He was a Mm. big fan of hers and requested for her to come. And um, they toured the library. And um, now she, in um, her journals and her writings, she was not a fan of him. But when, you know, the Prince Regent asks you to come, you go. Um, So, you know, it was known who wrote these novels, not initially. But over time, um, and it was, you know, and then when Pride and Prejudice came out, I believe it was, I'm going to mess up the word, but, you know, uh, uh, the same author is Sense and Sensibility. Her name didn't come on until I believe, um, I think it was Persuasion and Northanger Abbey that were published posthumously that had her name on them. Because those were published in 1817. Right, right. After she died. How did the reading public of her day whether they knew these books were written by Jane Austen or, or they just thought, you know, just I mean, had an anonymous. How were they received by the reading public of, of the early 19th century? They were popular. I mean, they, so in that time period, books were very expensive, but they had lending libraries. So you would go in and you would pay a subscription and you could go in and borrow books and stuff. And so, you know, they, a lot of the copies that were sold were obviously to the very wealthy or to these libraries. And so she did make some income from her books, which is remarkable because as a novelist mm-hmm. at that time, it's not like today um, that, you know, novelists can make a lot of money, but a novelist, they weren't at the top of the poll of, you know, the writers. They weren't at the top of the pay scale if you were a novelist. Um, other writers would have been making more money, but she did. And Sir Walter Scott was a big fan. He loved her novels, and we have some yes. really nice compliments by him. Um, and there Although are she, other did, she didn't like really his, them. right? She well, didn't I, actually like well, his. Well, I Walter agree Scott, with right? I agree with Walter Scott, and I also agree with Jane Austen. I like Jane Austen's novels. And I can't say that I like Walter Scott's novels. They are okay. they are drudgery to get through. Oh, I like <laughs> Scott, but I like yeah. all those little details I, I and all that I stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, but but anyhow, uh, something else I want to ask you, uh, Dr. D, some, something you said before the show that really fascinated me. I didn't know that she, her novels were disliked by the Bronte sisters a generation Absolutely. so late. Yeah, they did yeah, not why, like her. Why, yeah. Why? Why is that? Um, well, they they didn't they thought her novels were sort of trivial or trifle or silly little things. They were um, caught up in the sort of gothic wave that was coming through. Now they weren't the first female gothic writers, um, but they um, that was you know what they were interested in, and they didn't like Jane Austen. Now Jane Austen she died right around the same time that they were being born, so they didn't know each other. But mm-hmm. Jane Austen in their lifetime was popular enough that they would have known about her. And, you know, they lived in two very different parts of the country. The Brontes were up in the Northeast and Jane Austen was down in the Southwest area or the South area. So it's not that they would have been from the same village. So that's how they would have known each other. So it tells us a little bit about the popularity, but um, yeah, they just weren't fans. So it's really interesting um, that they tend to get lumped together for some reason a lot, Jane Austen Mm -hmm. and the Brontes. And no, you can't lump them together. First, their works are extraordinarily different. 
if you've read Wuthering mm -hmm. Heights and you've read Jane Eyre, those are the, probably the two most um, popular ones mm -hmm. by the two different sisters, then you, and you've read Jane Austen, you can see how different the writing is and the sense of life. Um, personally, I like Jane Eyre. Wuthering Heights for me has an abominable sense of life. Um, it's totally yeah. anti Jane Austen in my opinion. Yeah, Jane I, Eyre, I, I think, is incre incredible. It's heroine, an amazing. I, I, yeah, I like. Yeah. I like Jane mm -hmm. Eyre. Jane Eyre. And I've taught yeah. all. I've taught Jane Austen, and I've taught the Brontes. Um, okay. Well, let me let me yeah. ask you this, Diana. As the Bronte sisters were gearing up, you know, for their careers, is there any possibility there was some professional jealousy there that this that this other woman became successful? Yeah. And we're, we're striving. We're striving for. It? Yeah, probably. I mean, um, and. In kind of playing on that, there's a um, Jane Austen, a modern contemporary Jane Austen author named Siri James. And um, it, so there's a Jane Austen Society of North America and they have these annual meetings and their regional meetings. And I've been on the board of the regional groups and um, mm. I've helped them out with social media and stuff. Um, but there was a little skit that they, um, her and Diana Birchall, I believe, performed together of this sort of back and forth, like if they had met what they would have said to each other it was pretty comical and it wasn't you know they were sparring a little bit so right. it's fun. Mm -hmm. right. but yeah it's it's um, at least amongst people who have studied British literature particularly 19th century British literature I mean that kind of um, and it's not even a schism because Jane Austen wasn't alive but the sort of virtual schism is you know kind of well known you know, since, since Jane Austen wrote so beautifully about romantic love something just came to, to mind Maybe the the greatest real life love story I ever heard of is Robert Browning and, and Elizabeth Barrett. Oh my goodness! Were, you know, yeah, you know, you know mid nineteenth mm -hmm. century, a little, little bit later, a generation or two later than than Jane Austen. Do we have any commentary from Browning or Elizabeth Barrett on Jane Austen that, that that you know of? Do they do they have much to say about about her? Novels? I you know I haven't really thought of that question. Um, there's so well, I, I never did either I, until I never did either until just now. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, you know, Sonnets from the Portuguese is so beautiful. I even think about it and I want to start weeping. Yes. Mm -hmm. So especially, um, especially the first one. I love oh my the goodness, first, yeah. first one. Don't I'm gonna start crying, don't you? Do yeah, that. yeah, no, I know. <laughs> um, and I'm just such a big fan of the Brownings, but I haven't really put them into the context of Jane Austen. So that's an interesting topic that I'll probably go down a rabbit hole this week on. Right. So let me just, one last thing on this segment, uh, and actually, Andy, I want to speak to you in the sense of, if we go historically back in time, Jane Austen earned just enough, you know, published anonymously and earned just enough to stay out of the poorhouse to keep, and to keep her family out of the poorhouse, and all of her recognition happened you know, after all of this popularity, her name's household, after she died. If we look at someone today like a J.K. Rowling, who's a billionaire, whose works have sold and been translated into all these different mediums, what do you attribute that that difference to, Andy, over the over the centuries? Oh, well, you're asking, you're asking the guy who wrote the Capitalist Manifesto. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. The development of capitalism, you, you, I mean, you're, you're certainly right, Robert, um, you know, created a marketplace for, for writers. Yes. And, um, you know, the breaking the stranglehold of the aristocracy on, you know, on culture and, and on mm -hmm. the, you know, the, just the, the people created the opportunity for commoners to get to get educated. Now, we have yes. a government school system that doesn't do a very good job uh, of that. But that's another story, you know, for another day. But, you know, the commoners are, not, are no longer held back by the aristocrats from getting an education. So when, when mm -hmm. people, you know, learn how to read, when they, whether they do it at home or, you know, they're, home, they're homeschooled or, or go to private school, in some cases, the you know, government school system, you know, might do a better job. Some districts might be better than others, but you have more people who are literate. And so you have more customers, you know, the, you know yeah. and, and the, the rise of the industrial revolution of capitalism means people are making more money. They're much wealthier. They can afford to buy books. Books are probably luxuries back in the day. And books Easier to mass, print. Yeah. yeah, books are mass produced now by, right. by you know, mass publishing industry. Again, you know, the industrial revolution at work. So they're cheaper. People have more money. People are more literate. And a great writer like Jane Austen or later on the, the Bronte sisters or, you know, or you know, the Brown, Robert Brown, Elizabeth Barrett, or, you know, any, any great writers now can make money on, on you know, in a, in a marketplace, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. the marketplace of publishing that, that the capitalist system made possible. So I think that's a, yeah. big, a big difference. Yeah. 
Thanks for that. So yeah, well, I just have one last thing. The principle of individual right. rights, of course, is the essence of capitalism. Right. And as long as mm-hmm. individ- an individual's rights are you know respected and, and upheld, then an individual can pursue education. It's not, you know, the aristocrats they don't want you know people educated because That's right. then they might criticize mm-hmm. the moral rectitude of the you know of the king or the you know or the feudal barons or anything. So uh, the principle of individual rights makes it possible for everybody to pursue an education if they want one, which means more literate people, which means more of a market, more of a market for writers. Mm -hmm. Great. So just an announcement here, you're watching The Hero Show, which is brought by Objective Standard Institute. Uh, We have educational courses, we have conferences, and we have podcasts in addition to this one. So you can go to objectivestandard.org to find more information on that. And how about we go through the timeline, uh, Deanna, of Jane Eyre, uh, Jane Austen's. <laughs> I, I knew I'd mix those two up at some point. <laughs> well, <laughs> through, we're all, through, we're through all the, Jane Knights now. Yeah, through, so, you know, yeah, yeah. right. I didn't, I didn't think I'd end up a Jane Knight, but uh, but yeah, well, let's let's talk about um, uh, her dates and kind of her evolution as a as a person now. Okay, um, well, I'll give you a very brief biography. She was mm-hmm. born December 16th, um, 1775, which is a big Jane Austen day. So, uh, okay, if you're a well, fan, that's, a, that's a big day across the pond, too. In America. It, well, it's it a big is. year, big it year is. across the pond. They shot her around the world, was it? And also, December 16th is Boston Tea Party, two, were out, two years right. earlier. I know, so yeah. she was yeah. born big right day. in the thick of it, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but she was born in um, Hampshire, which is a um, County South in England, beautiful county if you've never been. And um, she- We'll call that Old Hampshire as opposed to our New Hampshire, correct? Yeah, 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 that's the Old Hampshire. And um, she died in 1817, she died of a sickness and she was very young, 42 when she died. Yeah. Um, never married and that's a very fun story. And there's a lot right. of kind of speculation about that as mm-hmm. well and a lot of intrigue. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, back in her time period, obviously no radio, no TV, books were limited. And um, her father was a preacher and he was given his, um, so back up a little bit, in the Regency period, and this was called a Regency because the king had a son that was kind of appointed as the ruler because the king was not seen fit to rule. So um, she, her life spans the rule of um, King George III, correct? King George was, III. Yeah, the famous. And then his son takes over and is the Prince yeah. Regent. That's who I was referring to. A little, okay. I mean, she's, I think, a teenager when that happens. Yeah. Um, and so, but she's born in this really interesting time period. And in this time period, you would have to have sponsored, and if you've read Dickens, you've read about this, particularly Great Expectations, you would have mm-hmm. to be sponsored for a position. So you would have to pay to be a barrister, to go apprentice or whatever. And so you couldn't just, not like today, where, oh, I'm going to go do this. Things were very different um, in England in the late 1700s. So her brother, Edward, there were um, eight children, two girls, and five boys, or six boys. Edward was the third born, and Um, Their father was given this sort of position was by his brother who was quite wealthy. And um, again, they had um, primogeniture. So usually the first son would inherit. Women were not allowed to inherit property, which Mm -hmm. is um, a big plot issue in Pride and Prejudice, if you've read that, as well as Sex and Sensibility. And it actually comes up quite a bit about the first son, second son, and those things. Mansfield Park, that's an issue as well, what Edmund's Mm -hmm. going to do. Um, And so his brother helped him get the sort of commission of being a priest or a rector in the town of um, Steventon. And so that's where her, what her father did. And, but her brother, Edward, the third son was adopted when he was about 12 years old by this wealthy brother that had given her father his commission as the rector or the appointment as a rector. Mm -hmm. And so Edward Knight actually supported Jane Austen, her sister Cassandra, whose fiance died over like um, on a ship. So she never married, Jane Austen never married and their widowed mother. So Edward um, provided the three Austen ladies a place to live, Chotton Cottage, which you can still visit today. See the table where Jane Austen wrote. It's um, I have yet to make my pilgrimage there, but mm. um, I have done many like, tours and stuff online and so i feel like i've been there um let's let me interject a second Dan. he sure. must have been a hell of a man 
if he lived with his mother and two sisters. No, he didn't. He <laughs> lived in the estate house. Oh, oh, he oh, gave okay. them a cottage okay. on the estate to live, uh, right? Uh, and he uh, was married and he had a lot of children as well. And um, his daughter, Fanny, was um, very close to Jane. In fact, we know a lot about Jane Austen's life and inner thinking because, through the letters to Fanny. Um, yeah. She also wrote extensively to her sister, Cassandra. But when Jane Austen died young, Cassandra Thousands of letters, any of the letters. Right? Yeah. What yeah, a but, shame. Yeah. It's just so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that happened, though, in that time period. I think it was just a way Same with the founders. Same, same with the founding fathers. That was- Absolutely. A, that was, they, yeah. They didn't, for posterity, it was just, they were private. These yeah. Were you know, um, privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, George Washington's letters were burned yeah. and, you know, yep. it was it was quite, yeah. um, I guess, the thing to do while you're mourning at that stage. Yeah. So, so at 11, she starts writing, correct? Is yeah. that when so, she and he, her father gave her that death? Well, that's when she first publishes Sense and Sensibility, but she had been been writing. So my point in a no, long I'm, I'm saying there, at age 11. Uh, oh, yeah. So at age yes. 11. But so she started making up these little stories to entertain her family because Right. That's what you did. You would, mm -hmm. you know, and she has this history of England, which is really funny. Mm -hmm. And she has these mm -hmm. other little, like what's called now the juvenilia. So if you're interested yeah. in her earliest work, she would look at those. Um, and so she would read out these little stories and her family would laugh and it became entertaining. And then neighbors and extended family would hear her. And, you know, it, in a way, I guess it would boost her confidence to keep on writing. But mm -hmm. she started writing first impressions, which turned into Pride and Prejudice when she was quite young. Um, and of mm -hmm. course, she rewrote it once she got a little older and a little more, you know, probably living a little bit to, you know, talk a little more about love and romance and things like that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Great. Deanna, because yeah. she writes so beautifully about romantic love uh, and love matters in her universe, as well as moral rectitude. You, yeah. you, women, women who have to marry for money. It's it, it, she shows it's a, you know, it's 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 bad because women can't have yes. careers of their own, so they they sometimes they can't have to be marry independent. Money. Yeah, right. they, they can't, can't live alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes have to marry for money. You know, even if the the guy they marry is they're not in love with them, he may not even be a good person. But uh, did she, this she wasn't married. Did she have any any romantic relationships? Yeah. So she um, and this mirrors what happens in Mansfield Park. She was engaged. She was asked to um, to be married, you know, asked to marry. Yes. And for she said yes. But by the morning, she withdrew her um, acceptance. So which would be kind of scandalous to say yes and then take it back. But I'm sure she's not the only person at this time that would have done that. To an um, Irishman, right? Yeah. Um, and so then um, she, his name is Harris... So, uh, it's a hyphenated word. The wither is the last name. I can't remember. I should know that. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that's okay. Yeah. And um, sure. actually, he's not Irish. He's um, he was an heir in a um, to a Hampshire family. So he was 21, and it was in okay. 1802. <clears throat> so she would have been 19. Um, and so, but there's other rumors, and we don't know for sure. But there's you know, kind of hearsay and some allusions and some of the correspondence that she fell in love with someone who died um, very soon after. And so mm -hmm. she would have been, you know, offered a hand in marriage to a very suitable person, mm -hmm. but declined because like Elizabeth Bennett, I'm only going to marry for, you know, love, not yeah. just because it's, you know, she's not going to do um, what others in her novel and a lot of her novels do where they just marry for security and um yeah charlotte lucas elizabeth oh Scrandon, yeah absolutely right? yeah just, charlotte lucas yeah. um you, you know, know and, even yeah and jane austen presents that very you know sympathetically that you know charlotte's in her late 20s she doesn't want to you know she doesn't want to be a burden on her family she can't have she can't have a career what's she gonna right. do the, the only the only thing she could do in that society is marry What's his name? Uh, the born Mr. Collins. Prince. Yeah, Collins. Oh, yeah. Who's a who's a Swarthy. Po pontificating? You know, <laughs> annoying, <laughs> annoying person. Yeah. Who, who, Even who Elizabeth turns down proper and properly. So, by the way, I just wanted to mention. So, yeah. <clears throat> Mrs. Excuse me, Mrs. Bennett's horrified. 
All she cares about is marrying off her daughters for security, like you said, Deanna. She doesn't care if Elizabeth's going to be happy or not, you know, you, you know with Collins. She, but but uh, Mr. Bennett, you know, I think if I remember correctly, Elizabeth is Mrs. Bennett's least favorite amongst her five children. But she's she's Mr. Yeah. Bennett's favorite, which shows some discernment on her father's yes. part because yes. she's so smart, honest, mm -hmm. forthright, mm -hmm. and frank. He appreciates all those qualities in his daughter. And he says he says, I'm like, thank God you you turned them down, Lizzie. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So let me just jump in uh, and say also the contrast in Mansfield Park when she goes back to her dirt poor family. She she explains what happened, and the mother says, and the father's a drunk with no yeah, ambition yeah but but the mother tells uh fanny i married for love and look what happened to me you know i think that's a pivotal scene in the sense that we we want love but we really want this moral you know this moral character that's the part that you know you're not seeing we as a reader can see that wait a minute this man is different that her father is different from uh, from Edmund in this case, you know, someone who she she's more interested in. And um, so that was in Bath, right? The where the relationship was with the um, uh, with the person that she was in love with uh, who passed away. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I think so. I um, OK, yeah, there's there's some the details are a little hard okay. to piece together um and then some still refute that there was somebody so oh, we don't okay. it's not that we know for sure okay. um she writes so effectively about romantic love you would think she had experienced it so maybe you know, yeah but, but sometimes people have a very vivid imagination it's That's, true it's you true know. You know, um, something else that I, I, I'd like to say, the the idea of fantasy, which comes out in the adaptations where they read novels and it just gives them these fantasies about how life should be. And I like in some of the adaptations how you see that kind of fantasy played out and then the character either wakes up or just comes out of the stupor that, no, you're back, you're back in reality. I think she does that very effectively. I think so, absolutely. And I, one of uh, for me, one of the best examples of that is in Sensibility, Sense and Sensibility with Marianne, and what mm. she, you know, she is this idealistic um, romantic, and mm -hmm. it takes her, you know, getting her heart broken to yeah. really understand what love is, and right. yeah, right. and it's just it's a really amazing and beautiful way that it's played out. Mm -hmm. with Marianne. Can we switch Can we, over to the, but, go ahead, Andy, you got something. Yeah, so one, I just yeah. want to put forth, you know, some, something I speculated about that you may have some insight into, Deanna, and that is uh, if Jane Austen had ever written a novel about an aspiring, you know, woman, young woman who's an aspiring writer and the struggles, you know, of, of, a, of a woman to publish in, you know, turn of the 19th century Britain, <laughs> Uh, if, she, if she ever had any thoughts about, you know, you know, a semi-autobiographical novel about her own, her own career. So, so yeah, you certainly have a built-in conflict, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, very talented writer, social prejudices against her. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if she ever considered writing such, or she wrote about it in her journals and not, do you know, do you know anything about that? Um, not that I know. <laughs> I mean, it may exist. We know that like when, um, when she, died she was working on um lady susan or, or she um sanded in sorry and um but it was never finished and that was more like i think her she did a lot of social commentary and this one in particular was about the people that would go away to like the coast or the spas for their health and all the shenanigans that would happen <laughs> so mm -hmm. um again very funny um mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I don't know if she's, you know, in particular, if she wrote um, a work of fiction about that. I can't think like if there are any sort of notes or anything. Yeah. Um, it would be, be very interesting to read. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Got that built in mm -hmm. conflict there, you know, yeah. against, uh, you know, uh, a very independent, hard headed Jane Austen heroine against the social prejudices and mores of her day. That would be, you know, right. that would be a, a terrific story. Mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, maybe so, somebody somebody could write a historic novel you know about Jane Austen you know in, in that regard 
That's a segue, Andy. So a uh, dear friend of mine, ball fellow ballet dancer, is choreographer and a filmmaker, is making, he's putting together this uh, ballet for that has Jane Austen as one heroine and then four of her other main character heroines. And his point is he he she starts out at a desk conceiving of these different, you know, these these different characters that she's going to write about. And one of his goals is to kind of put Jane Austen in the room with her heroines and and play that out on on a dance stage. So uh, one thing I was going to ask you is in the current, how does she inspire people today, like artists and and writers today, Deanna? Do you have um, something? Well, there. That? I mean, you there's so much out there. Um, what you were talking about the ballet that reminds me of a play, and I'm racking my brain to remember the name of it that I saw in Seattle a few years ago, where. It, um, mm -hmm position Jane Austen and she's having a conversation with the characters of Pride and Prejudice while she's writing and it was really okay. very well done and very entertaining mm -hmm. um, um, sounds like it yeah uh, there you know there's been so I mean there's so many film adaptations so many spin-off novels I mean there's um novels that take one character so there's one called Mary B where it's what happens to Mary Bennett the sort of dowdy very religious one what happens to her and mm -hmm. how she sort of flourishes and that's an interesting um story and what happens what happens to airhead lydia that's uh, that, that's oh, <laughs> she gets what she deserves in my opinion <laughs> yeah marriage marriage yeah. to the scoundrel wickham right yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. yeah that's something i want to say about what what a brilliant social critic Jane Austen is yes you know I mean I mean you know so so you have Wickham who's just you know he's a ne'er-do-well and he's amoral and he doesn't care he's going to bring disgrace on Lydia Bennett he knows it he's a lot older than she doesn't matter to him right uh but also the way Jane Austen presents some of the ladies Mrs. Bennett is so frivolous all she cares about is marrying off her daughters for security whether they're happy or, or not and then she encourages the younger sisters, you know, Lydia and was it Kitty, the one yeah. who, who follows Lydia. Yeah. All they mm -hmm. care about is flirting with the officers in the, you know, in the in the regiment. And they're like, they're like complete airheads. <laughs> Jane Austen. Yeah, their father mock, refers to mocks them, them. Yeah, their father refers to them as silly girls on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Lydia should I don't know she's 15 or 16 when she runs off with with, yeah. with them. Yeah, oh, she, okay, so she's very young. We can excuse uh, her, you know, for that. But but still, she's courting, given the religious uh, culture, but, you know, the strength of Christianity and the culture and the mores of the society, at 15 or 16, uh, you know, raised as a gentleman's daughter, she would know the disgrace that she is courting. And that, you know, as Jane Austen put it, she may, and if, if Darcy doesn't intercede and lean on Wickham to marry her, uh, mm -hmm. Lydia Bennett may end up on the town, as uh, Jane Austen puts the expression of that day. Right. To, and, you know, but, prostitute. and she, mm -hmm. you know, Jane Austen sets this up in um, two, I'm trying to see how many times this happens, at least two of the novels I can think of, where Wickham runs off with Lydia, right? And that's a huge scandal. But he before tried to run off with Georgiana Darcy. Right. So there's a pattern mm -hmm. there. And we see the same thing mm -hmm. in Sense and Sensibility. And Mansfield where, Park, too. With and and the Mansfield one who, Park. With, with the one who's yeah. in love with her. And yeah, with Henry Crawford. He catches him in, so, in bed. Mm -hmm. and, Wick, um, and Willoughby and Sense and Sensibility. So this, this rakish character, you know, we see over yeah. and over again. So I always think, I'm like, wow, she must have known some really colorful people in her day, or at least known of. Um, yeah, you know, very, because very as charming. writers, we write what we know. I mean, right, we yeah. use our mm -hmm. imagination and we can exaggerate, but there had to have been some sort of precedence here that she was, because she's a social commentator, like you said. Yeah. So she was, you know, making commentary about these rakish men who would take advantage of these young idealistic romantics. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. These, these, they're not women. I mean, Lydia Bennett's like they're girls. Or six. Yeah, they're girls. Yeah, they're girls. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, take advantage uh, uh, of her and, and not care what's going to happen to her when, when he doesn't no. marry her. She's, she's, she might end up on the town as a nice euphemism. And then a, <laughs> it is. 
for being a, a working girl, for, you know, for being a, a prostitute. That's a horrible life for any, got to be a horrible life for any woman. And, and Wickham, is, he's, he's, a, he's a complete degenerate. I mean, and mm -hmm. one thing I love about Jane Austen, she, she has, she's not you know, reticent about condemning this, this kind of behavior. She has moral standards. That's right. right. And yes. Darcy, you know, Pride and Prejudice, I just reread so you know a few months mm -hmm. ago, so it's fresh in my mind. Uh, and it's interesting in the theme in Pride and Prejudice, something like, you know, charm is a is a good thing to have, social grace is a good thing to have, but character above all, right? Darcy yes. doesn't have the social graces, but he has the character. <laughs> and, and and there's a and there's a you know there's a certain selfishness in a, in a, in a positive sense here when, you know, mm -hmm. when, uh, Elizabeth realizes what Darcy has done. People in her family, uh, you know, t told her and she thanks him, you know, from her heart. And he's thank you for, for my family. And Darcy says to her, yeah, I got no problem with your family, but I did this for you. You know, she said, I did yes. this to win you because I yes. love you. But the rest of it is nice, but it's the gravy. I did this to win you, Elizabeth. You know, he's, 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 he's very focused on his own happiness, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and he's right. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth is, is the right woman for him. She's so smart. She's so honest. I love the way mm -hmm. she stands up to his aunt, Lady Catherine, who's an over bell. What a great characterization. Lady mm -hmm. Catherine is. Oh, you see so Jane funny. Austen, you, know, <laughs> you have nightmares, you have nightmares about somebody like, like that. You know, also the word, the Elizabeth words Bennett, that she Elizabeth uses. Bennett, Elizabeth Bennett is very calmly tells her, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, promise you to refuse any offer from your nephew. <laughs> what about the words that she uses to him when she first rejects him, you know, when she accuses him? It's it's like beautifully written <laughs> literature, you know, these were and it gets to him because he he's a fan of the of the written word. He uh, you know, Darcy really that's really important to him and articulating clearly the way she does that and then he writes the letter you know, to her, which uh, goes towards changing her mind. So um, just to start to wrap this up, uh, <clears throat> Dr. D, as Andy calls, Andy calls you, um, adaptations versus the novels. W uh, are there good ones? Are there better ones? Are there ones that you feel like, you know what, don't even go there? We yeah, anything past 1995, don't even go there. Okay. Um, <laughs> but we always that, say that, don't, that don't, 1995 don't... BBC production was pretty good, right? It was amazingly excellent. Yes. Um, Andrew yeah. Davies wrote the screenplay. The Emma Thompson Sense and Sensibility is amazing. The one thing about adapting Jane Austen, which makes it so easy, is that the dialogue is already already there. Yeah. She makes it easy. So she's written mm -hmm. everything out. Yeah. Um, whereas um, I know the objective of standard who's a sponsor, you know, Ayn Rand you have to condense so much to pull her major novels into a movie, even a two hour movie. Um, but for That's Jane Austen- I And they're very cerebral on top of that. Yeah, so, it's a yeah. very, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's an easier adaptation, not easy, but easier if you're gonna yeah. do a comparison because mm -hmm. I mean, the dialogue is there. Now for me, what they did in the 2005 version with Keira Knightley of Pride and Prejudice, I think it's an abomination. They mm -hmm. chose to omit some scenes that are, just pinnacle. Uh, the whole film is very drab. It's very postmodern in its sensibility, and mm -hmm. it ruins mm -hmm. Jane Austen, in my opinion. And there is a big schism amongst the Janeites. By the way, um, Kipling coined that term, the Janeites, in his um, one oh, of his really? short stories. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and there's a big schism, and I think younger Janeites like the Kieran Knightley because that's the one they grew up on, and older and they're like Kieran Knightley. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> older Jane Knights are loyal to the Colin Firth, Jennifer Ely version. Yes. Um, and I am in the, of the latter camp. So um, I'm mm -hmm. definitely very loyal. In fact, when I was uh, teaching college, I would grade papers with Pride and Prejudice in the background. So if I need to get into a workflow state, I just put that movie on and the music mm -hmm. and within five minutes, I'm in a flow state and I can just power through work. That, and that, that one with Colin nice. Firth and, and who played Elizabeth? Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. Ely. Uh, my question here is, who played Lady Catherine? Because she was oh, great. I don't remember. She now, was great. She is great. And I mean, um, talk about a daunting harridan. I mean, somebody you want to run from, like she had a bola. I mean, she really played that character brilliantly. It's yeah, the the acting and I mean, it's over five hours. It's a mini series, so they had yeah, a lot yeah. more time to flesh out the novel. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it's pretty much, it's very, very true. If someone was to come to me and say, hey, I, you know, I, I want to um, dive into Jane Austen, I would tell them the order to read the books, start with Pride and Prejudice, then you get to choose Sense and Sensibility and Emma, whichever one, you don't read second, you read third, and then um, you go to Mansfield Park, Northanger Abbey, and find always finish with Persuasion. It's like mm -hmm. the icing on the cake for me. Mm, that's great. 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 Thank you, Lady D. And for and the movies, just get a subscription to BritBox and watch all the BBC versions and then you're good. You don't need to watch anything else. If you want a little exotic flavor, the Bollywood Bride and Prejudice is really good, but most wow. of them I don't okay. like. So the Colin Firth, Jennifer Ely version, that was 90, that, uh, Pride and Prejudice. That 95, was 1995, BBC. Right? Okay. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. Right. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with you, Lady D. I thought that was excellent. The mm -hmm. adaptation and of Jane Austen. The latest adaptation of Emma is visually stunning, like a Wes Anderson movie, but it was really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. if you're a loyal fan. Yeah. You're a true yeah. Jane Knight. So you, you said Kipling coined the term Jane Knight? Mm -hmm. He has a story oh. called The Jane, Jane Knights um, about World War II soldiers in the trenches reading Jane Austen and how it lifted their spirits. Oh, wow. oh boy. It's, wow. really wow. it's, yeah, in, it's nice. in the volume called Debits and Credits. Well, hard yeah. to find, but amazing if you can get it. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. Kipling had a way with words. He did. I, I, <laughs> I, I love Ricky Ticky, Ricky Ticky Taffy. Yes. You know. <laughs> and by the if. way, yeah. By the way, uh, Kipling make a good, um, you know, subject yeah. for hero subject show. for the hero show. Yeah. 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 For our, um, our homeschool company, we have a whole unit on um, Ricky Ticky Taffy, and I bring Kipling in. It's amazing. Good, good stuff. Yes. Well, thank you, Lady D. Dr. Deanna yes. Haken in for coming on the show and lending us your wisdom regarding you. you know a, a, a great author who's uh, who, what can we benevolent say? universe yeah definitely yeah. we could call it benevolent universe with the happy endings that's what, yeah uh, that's yeah what grips me well mm -hmm. where love is romantic love is beautifully portrayed where moral mm -hmm. character matters above all else those are yes. the things I love about Jane Austen yeah mm -hmm. so great. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody. We're going to do it. Yeah, we got we got to salute Jane Austen. Her, her <laughs> Let's do a Mr. Darcy salute. salute, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I we used salute. my wrong hand. Sorry. No, we salute. That's OK. Dr. D, you're the guest here. You can do whatever you like. That's um, true. You know, so we, we want to salute Jane Austen uh, for her, her achievements, mm -hmm. the inspiration she provides. And so join us again next week on The Hero Show, where we continue to seek inspiration from great men and great women. And let's all strive to be the hero or heroine of our own lives. So have a great day, everybody. We'll Thank see you, you. next week on The Hero Show.